in the uh, rural Baptist fellowships that we belong to up in Oklahoma, mostly older folks, and it's just such a joy to be here where there's uh, older folks like us, but all these young people. It's just a joy seeing what the Lord's doing here. Charles, amen. That's life. God has given to us to be a good steward of. Charles Spurgeon told a story about an elderly, elderly preacher who was attending the first service of a young man who was preaching, starting out. And when the young fellow had finished, he sought out the older gentleman to ask him what he thought of the sermon. And the older guy looked the young man in the eye and said, not much. What was the problem with the message? The young guy asked. So well, there was no Jesus in your message, young man. But sir, he replied, there was no mention of Jesus in the text. And the elder preacher leaned in close and told him, son, there's a saying in England that every road leads to London. Not all of them go straight there, but to London you can get. And every sermon must lead your people to the cross. It may not be a direct route as in the gospel accounts, but even if you have to take them over the hedges and through the swamps and through the dark valleys, you must take your people to Christ. So we're going through the Sunday school series on finding Christ in the Old Testament. Is he there? The scriptures testify of him. Our charge is to preach and to teach Christ. And it's important and incumbent on us to find Christ in the scriptures and not simply make him up. One rule to help us is called the analogy of faith. Scripture interprets scripture. Man doesn't interpret scripture. Man comes to God and pleads for understanding and looks to scripture to interpret scripture. And there are several ways that the scriptures reference other passages. We have direct citations where a passage is quoted in a different place. And you'll find a good example of this in Hebrews 8, where a big chunk of Jeremiah 31 is just plopped in there and quoted. There are indirect references or allusions, and we'll see one or two of those in our message this morning. And then there are allegories, where something is identified as something that it isn't, such as in Galatians 4, where Hagar and Sarah are called covenants. They're not covenants, but they are representing covenants in that. And then you have types and shadows. And this is where something real represents something different that's also real. Such as the rock in Exodus 17 is called Christ in 1 Corinthians 10. Types and shadows can be identified with authority if the messianic and apostolic scriptures show us if they do not show us, we have to be very guarded that we don't start making up things that aren't there. Here's one well-known and very clear example where God is rehearsing Israel's history and observes in Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. When this was written, it was a historical reference to national Israel's exodus from Egypt. Yet, when Yahweh brought the infant nation out by a strong arm, yet the Spirit of God spoke through Matthew, saying that it was a prophecy that spoke of the Christ. In Matthew 2, 14 and 15, when he arose, Joseph, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, out of Egypt I called my son. And there we see that Je Jesus is true Israel. That's the, that's the equivalent that M Matthew is calling out. Now, this particular citation has driven liberals mad because humanly speaking, what Matthew wrote is not true to Hosea's record. But God spoke, and as then one of those psalms we sang, who are we to question what he has done, what he has said? 
So we sit back in awe and say, when we read Matthew 2, what a thing, what a marvelous thing God has revealed to us. While researching this topic, I ran across a commentary on the Ark of the Covenant as a type of Christ. A well-known theologian said this about another type within that discussion of the Ark of the Covenant. He said, the Ark was two and a half cubits in length, one and a half in breadth, and one and a half in height. The repeated half at once arrests our attention. The word half in the Hebrew comes from a root word, which means to cut in two. And he references somebody else who said that these half cubits suggest the knowledge of Christ given to us now is only partial. And he references 1 Corinthians 13, 9, now we see in part. Now I ask you this. You go read the account in Exodus about the Ark of the Covenant, and you go search all throughout the rest of the scriptures, and you cannot find a correlation between the measurement of the ark being a half cubit here and there, being anything remotely connected to, we only see Christ in part. That is something that man made up. And it's a nifty little connection, has no basis in scripture. So that man has crossed a line I hope to stay away from. Our charge is not to see how close we can get to the edge of the thin ice. Our charge is to stay safe in the solid word of God. The type we're going to look at today is in the Ark of Noah. So if you would turn to Genesis 6 and verse 11, the title of this lesson is Safety in the Flood. And I will submit to you right now that the pattern we see in Scripture is not that we get taken out of danger. The pattern that we see in Scripture is that though we go through danger, if we are God's people, He preserves us and protects us and brings us through it. Maybe not in the way that we would have thought He would have, but nonetheless, He does it the way that He thinks is right. I'm going to read a big chunk because it's important for us to see what's going on. So Genesis 6 11 through chapter 7. Stay with me here. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits. It height 30 cubits. You'll make a window for the ark and you will finish it to a cubit from above and set the door in the ark and its side. And you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh which is in the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. And they shall be male and female." of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven of each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two of each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also, seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old 
when the floodwaters were on the earth. Uh, we were talking earlier about how as we get old, things get kind of more difficult for us. Dan, Noah was 600 years old. So Noah with his sons, his wife and his son's wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the water of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth, and the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifth cubits upward, upward and the mountains were covered and all flesh died that moved on the earth birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man all whose nostril in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life all that was on the dry land died so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground both man and cattle creeping things and bird of the air they were destroyed from the earth only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Wow. Did you hear that repeated emphasis that everything on the earth was going to die? It dawned on me while I was studying this that there's a couple of different important points that need to be brought out here. There's probably more than that, but there's three things I want to bring out. The first one is that this flood narrative is representative of our time, and it's particularly representative of redemptive history. There's a couple of types in here also, which really speak to the point of where we are in our lessons. I see the flood as a type of wrath of God on Judgment Day, and the ark is a type of Christ on the same day. But first, I want to look at some representations or illusions contained in this passage. We read in Genesis 6:11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. That was the condition of mankind. When Noah walked, when Jesus walked, when his apostles walked, John wrote in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God. We, the people of God, I know that we are of God and the whole world. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. When we look around and we see what's going on in our country and around the world, is it not evident that the world lies under the sway of the wicked one? It's not the question of why is man so wicked? That's his natural state. The thing that ought to resonate with our souls is that he has saved us. Not, not just from being wicked like those people because, you know, we're not all pure and perfect yet, but he has redeemed us and reconciled them to, our, to himself. The Bible portrays the contrast between these two groups or categories of people throughout its pages. The world is a system opposes God and cannot be made by man to submit to God. 
cannot be made by man to submit to God. You cannot argue your friends and neighbors and children and grandchildren into the kingdom. Neither can I. No, God said to Noah, verse 13, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And we'll see in a bit how Peter shows this to be a type of judgment that falls on the wicked on judgment day. And we see in Genesis that God's wrath is announced and executed and man can do nothing to delay it or to survive it. In verses 17 and 18, God says, Behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from heaven all flesh, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will go into the ark you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. In the midst of this judgment, this calamity that the world had never seen, Yahweh declares he will establish a covenant with Noah and all that are in the ark. And while the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, Jesus declares his covenant for those who are in him. He said in Luke twenty two twenty, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. My dear brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, you are safe from his wrath in the midst of the wicked world that is hell bound. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me. Take these animals with you and to keep the species alive because I I will cause it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights and I will destroy, destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. See, God is the creator and he's saying that he has creator rights to do with he, what he wants with the creation. He created all life. He can destroy all life. This from Genesis 7, 1 through 4 is alluded to in Luke 17 as the Lord Jesus told his disciples, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, Moses doesn't give an account of what the people were doing while he was building the ark. It took him about a hundred years to build the boat. But the absence of any radical response to the building of the ark would imply that life went normally. That's what Jesus observes. They were doing all these normal things. But every intent of their hearts was only evil continually, the Bible says. And this is the plight of natural man. The man who is not in Christ, though he may do good things, Marry, stay faithful to his wife, have kids, have a job, pay his taxes, obey the laws. Good citizen by all mortal accounts. Every inclination of his heart is only evil continually because the carnal mind is at hostility with God, at enmity with God, and cannot submit itself to to him. Genesis 7:11 reveals that how on that day the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain on the earth for woods for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen how John describes the final judgment from Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 through 14. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of place. And then you go to Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. 
And there were noise and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake and such a mighty and great, great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. And the city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And the great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Great signs from of the up, of upheaval in heaven and on earth with no place of refuge for man. In Noah's day, the heavens opened up and something that had never happened, happened. Rain fell. It had never rained on the earth until God opened the heavens by meaning that which lies above the clouds and rain fell. What a mysterious thing. It's, it's similar in my mind. When we were in Oklahoma and we got this dog from a rescue unit and the first winter we had the dog, it snowed and he'd never seen snow before. And he went out into the yard looking around at this stuff falling from the sky, not knowing what it was. And that, to me, has got to be like these people that lived in Noah's day, walking around. What is this stuff? They didn't, they didn't know what it was called. God opened up the heavens. At the end of the age, the heavens are going to open up. The third heaven's going to open up. And judgment's going to fall. The waters covered the mountains in Noah's day. The mountains are going to flee away from the wrath of the Lamb at the end of the age. Moses tells us that those that entered, male and female, went in as God had commanded, and the Lord shut them in. We see here the provision of God to save those that he had chosen, just as he had done with the spiritually elect. Why did God not just start all over and create man again? He could have, but he didn't. Not everybody that was on the ark turned out to be good. Noah got drunk. There was that incident with his boys where the son of one of them got cursed. I won't go into the Schofield reference Bible error and citing that. Carnal people, imperfect people. God displaying, I think, to his angels grace that they don't receive and demonstrating to man just like he would say later to Israel I didn't call you to myself because you were powerful and large I called you to myself to reveal myself to you and though we are not without sin like Noah was not without sin. We have been called into the ark of safety. We have been sealed by the Spirit so that we cannot fall out of the ark. And we are secure in the storm that rages against us. John 6, 37, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me. All the animals that he had called went into the ark. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And you go look at John 6, or 10, 28, and 29. Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. <laughs> God chose his sheep and they will come to the good shepherd and he will shut them in so that the flood of the wrath, wrath cannot touch them. There's a big difference in the Bible between the wrath of God and trouble and tribulation and travail. And in this world, you will have trouble, but fear not, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. What he saves us from is judgment. He doesn't save us to our best life now here on this planet. He says, you will have trouble. There will be disease. There will be hunger. There will be brokenness. There will be times to weep. 
Yet you always have cause to be thankful. You always have cause to rejoice if you are in Christ. Because he has promised that he has gone to prepare a place and he is coming back to take us to be where he is. There's another allusion, I think, in Genesis 7. The waters prevailed and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. I think this is a reference indirectly to Genesis 1-2 where we read, during the creation account, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the creation account, the waters are part of the earth, earth in its infancy. In the flood account, what's new is an intermediate destruction of the earth and something new is going to be coming up after the flood. And so the, the ark hovers over the waters like the spirit hovered over the waters in Genesis chapter 1. And the ark alludes to the spirit of God, which reinforces the typology that I see where the ark represents either or both the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ because, you know, the Godhead is not divided. We come to God because God chose us. The Spirit redeems us. Faith in Christ keeps us. All three work together for our good according to His plan. The end of chapter 7 ends with the final declaration of doom where He destroyed all living things which are on the face of the earth. Only those, only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And we see a, a similar scene at the end of the age in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Only those who were in the ark remained alive. Only those whose names are in the book of life will remain alive forevermore. Creation, sin, warning, wrath, salvation. The flood account represents our time and it represents the entire scope of redemptive history. And please note, God preserved Noah and his people in the midst of the flood. He didn't rescue them out of the flood and give them a happy land, happy land over here with no memory and no knowledge of the death of of millions of people. No doubt, many of the people that perished were their friends and neighbors. All the animals that Peter mourns for, dead. Because the Creator decided that He had seen enough of the wickedness of man. Now we're going to look at two types quickly. During the days of Noah, the wickedness of man filled the earth, and God chose Noah to be a preacher of righteousness, Peter says, speaking truth to the people of the world as he built the ark that God has instructed, had instructed and commanded them to do. Think about it. When Noah began building the ark, no one had seen rain, and there had, there had been boats around on the bodies of water, but in the middle of dry land, a boat this big, that was odd. And as recorded in Luke, and as I read to you in Matthew, people went on their normal business during the entire century that Noah was cutting down trees, sawing up logs, putting the boat together. And if you've, if you've seen the pictures of the representation of the ark in Tennessee, I think it is, or Kentucky, it's big. 300 cubits? That's, uh, what? 450 feet, pretty much, long. Big boat. The ark saved people from God's wrath. The great flood was the wrath of God. Only those chosen by God, both man and beast, were given refuge in the ark. And God closed them up by shutting the door. So is this a type of Christ? Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. page 1689, I think it is. And we're going to look at 5 through 7, 1679. 2 Peter chapter 3, 5 through 7. 
For this they willfully forget. They, the scoffers Peter's talking about earlier in this chapter. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with waters. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So in 2 Peter 3, we find out that the water that God put on earth destroyed life during the great flood and that God will, on his appointed day, destroy the temporal heavens and earth and ungodly men. The flood brought the first death to all creatures. Well, yeah, the first death. Not the first death experienced by any creatures, but the first death, as Paul says. You have die the first death in the flesh. And the second death is those who die, die not in Christ. So killed all the creatures on earth, save eight. The coming wrath will bring the second death to all men who are not in the ark who is Christ. So the great flood brought the first death to virtually everything on the earth. This, the judgment from God on judgment day will bring the second death to all who are not in the ark. Judgment foretells judgment, giving us every warrant to warn sleepers and scoffers to look under Christ Jesus and cry out for mercy. Nobody should comfort those who do not know Christ saying they're there, all will be fine. They are storing up for themselves wrath to be meted out on the day of judgment. And they need to be warned to flee from that wrath. And the only place of refuge is in Christ. Turn back a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 3. And starting in verse 18, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which... Few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. This is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the flesh of, of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter 3, the New King James uses the word antitype. The King James uses the term like figure. And other translations use the term corresponds, saying this corresponds to that. There's a question amongst commentators as to which is the type and which is the anti-type, which is the shadow, which is the substance in this passage. That's what we're going to look at here. Many commentaries claim that Peter's grammatical construction means that he saw the floodwaters as a type for the anti-type of water baptism. So they acquaint the flood of the waters with going under the waters for baptism. Many people claim that this passage verifies that water baptism is salvific. You cannot be saved unless you are dumped. Maybe sprinkled works, but water baptism must be done if you're to be saved. Of this baptism, Peter says, which saves us, he's not speaking of water baptism because water baptism is that which merely cleans his filth off of the flesh. He says what this baptism is, is that it gives a clear conscience to those who have been cleansed from sin. Spiritual baptism. When John came, Kyle preached on this earlier in Matthew, he said, I baptize with water unto repentance, but there is one coming who will baptize with the Spirit and with fire. And I agree with Kyle when he said this represents salvation and judgment, both 
come from Christ. Peter, I believe, is talking about that spiritual baptism because that's what gives us a clean answer, a clean conscience towards God. Water baptism signifies this cleansing, but it does not provide that cleansing. Spiritual baptism corresponds to the substance of the shadow of Noah's Ark, and that would be regeneration. The Ark provided salvation from judgment, which was the flood. Spiritual baptism, which is regeneration, provides refuge in the Ark, which is Christ, from the flood of judgment that comes at the end of the age. So if the water baptism isn't the antitype, the floodwaters in Noah's days aren't the type. How do we read this? A lot of commentators say that, well, the floodwaters saved Noah and his family by lifting the ark. That didn't save them. If the judgment hadn't come, if the water hadn't flooded, the ark, the Savior, wouldn't be needed. The floodwaters were not what saved Noah and his family. They were God's judgment on the reprobate world. And that the waters lifted the ark is not what saved them. Them being in the ark is what saved them. So, as I've said before, and what we can say here is that the flood waters represent God's judgment, and the ark that Noah built corresponds to the Lord Jesus or to the Holy Spirit, who gives life to that which was dead, saving souls. He gives us refuge from the wrath of God, which will re consume the world when he comes a second time. And since all three persons in the Holy Trinity work together as God, we can say that it is God who saves us from God's wrath. And the floodwaters in the ark are typical of the substance we find in Christ Jesus. John Gill said, The ark was a type of Christ into whom whoever enters by faith or in whom whoever believes shall be saved. Gill said that the water saved Noah by raising his ark. So, Gil's right, but not totally right. The flood was the wrath of God destroying all life on the planet that he didn't put in the ark. The bottom of the ark was covered with pitch inside and out. Pitch was a flammable substance used as fuel, and in Isaiah, it's a metaphor for God's judgment. He says in Isaiah 34, 8 through 10, It is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its streams shall be turned into pitch and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. In Hebrews 6, the term for pitch is kafar, and it's usually translated not as pitch, but is normally interpreted as to atone, to purge, to reconcile, to forgive, to cover, to propitiate. This covering was between the flood and the safety provided by the ark. It's what kept the floodwaters from getting between the boards and into the boat. Wooden boats have to have sealant between the joints or as the wood shrinks as it ages, water will get in. In the old days, they covered the wood inside and out with pitch to mitigate this tendency of the wood to shrink a bit. Pitch kept the water out of the boat. The covering of pitch atoned for, propitiated the boat from God's wrath. The suffering of Christ when he made propitiation for our sins stood between us and the wrath of God. We are safe because of what Christ did as he stands between us and the holiness of God. 
He took the flood of wrath of the wrath of God when He stood in our place. When the sun returns, it will be as in the days of Noah. People who have ignored the warnings of Christ's prophets, those who have no safety in the ark, those people of the world commonly referred to as the sea, they will suffer the wrath of God. Only those chosen by God, called into the safety of the ark, which is Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit, will be safe. If wrath terrifies you, cry out for mercy. Judgment is coming, and there is no escape other than the ark, which is Christ Jesus. If you are Christ's, do not be put off by his just wrath poured out on sinners. But be in awe that you are not counted among them. Be in awe at being the undeserving recipient of his grace. Have compassion on those who are perishing and suffering. Those that do not know Christ do not need to be railed against as some do. They need to be warned. They need to be pointed to the risen Lord. Those who are in Christ and are suffering, they don't need to be reminded, you're in Christ, everything will work out. They need to be comforted, 2 Corinthians, comfort those who are suffering with the same comfort the Holy Spirit has given you. It is to simply love one another. People don't need to be lectured. They need to be loved. The, the three friends of uh, Job did him the best service the first week they were there because they showed up and they shut their mouths. Something to learn from there. So, judgment because of sin. The wrath of God coming because of sin. The only refuge, the only answer, the only the only covering that can protect us from wrath is that which Christ has provided. We have His work. We have His mediation. We have His imputed righteousness, alien righteousness, the clothes of righteousness, John says in the Apocalypse. That covers us from the wrath to come. Rejoice if you are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that you have not left us to our own devices.